Welcome back to Black Belt Secrets. Uh, you might have seen my video yesterday talking about Lucy Connolly, and there's been a lot of questions raised about what did she do, what did she say, and with the previous things that she said going towards obviously what they're prosecuting her for now, how much can they consider those? What does that really mean? So without talking specifically about that case, I thought it does raise some fairly general things such as bad character that Alan and I thought we'd talk to you about here. So a bit more of a free, free, free flowing conversation about bad character evidence, which can include anything to do with previous convictions or anything really that goes against the general nature of the person when used in a prosecution. And there are what we call gateways that you need to bring in this evidence. So we just thought we'd have a bit of a ramble about that. So if you find that interesting, uh, please do subscribe. This is a more free flowing channel. Um, how are you doing today? Well, you're not doing very well, are you? have been coughing I'm for the last few videos. Yeah. I, I just I want to just shift this shift cough, this and as people have seen, I've tried the I'll just walk and sweat it all out, and that just nearly killed me. So now I'm just sitting still and feeling sorry for myself and drinking cough medicine. Well, coffee's cough medicine, so I've got some coffee here. But no, uh, as you can all probably hear, I was not doing too well. But for that reason alone, you should go over to Art of Law and subscribe. At least he's got some um, ni nicer views than I do sometimes here. But um, I need to get out and about and walk and talk a bit more as well. So bad character evidence, Al. What, what's your what's your take on on this this general approach with not obviously not talking specifically about this case? I know. I know she's remanded into custody. She's uh, pleaded to this offence, but nonetheless, we'll talk generally rather than about this specific case. But generally, what's your take on some uh, the, the the prosecutors looking back at what people have previously posted online? Because there's a there's a narrow line. Just to give people context that haven't watched my previous video, there's a narrow line beyond which you cross, it becomes criminal. So you can post opinions, really, even if they're strong opinions, even if they're going to upset people, cause tensions and all of that sort of stuff. You can post those opinions. You can say, I don't like this, I don't like that, this shouldn't happen, that shouldn't happen. But once it crosses a line that you are inciting somebody or what you say is going to disrupt public order, then it becomes bad. But Al, what's your take on prosecutors looking back generally at what people have posted online? Well, one of the most interesting things is, in my career, I've been doing this, what, 27 years now, is the change in how bad character evidence is regarded. Because it used to be that trying to put bad character in, it was what we called the forbidden thinking. There were lots of cases saying it shouldn't generally go in because it, it's not relevant. You know, there's no such offence of being a burglar. The offence is burglary on this specific occasion at this specific location. So the argument was, well, the mere fact you've done it before, that's not evidence that you did it this time. And it's like, you know, the old round up the usual suspects in Casablanca. It was to get away from that idea that you wouldn't investigate crime. You'd just look for oh, who always does this. So bad character only went in in very sort of unusual, you know, it wasn't a regular thing to go in. It could either go in if it was something we'll call similar fact, where there was a pattern of offending and there was something very unusual about it. Uh, so what were the odds on it being somebody different? And the example they would give is somebody who robs banks wearing a clown suit. You know, because that, in, that you know, on this occasion, you're accused of robbing a bank wearing a clown, a clown suit. You have previous convictions where you've robbed a bank wearing a clown suit. That's unusual. But Merely, you've got previous convictions for robbing banks. Well, you know, lots of people used to rob banks, so that doesn't really go anywhere. And the only other time it went in was if you either alleged you were of good character or you criticised somebody else's character, then they could say, well, hang on, that's a false impression, so let's hear a little bit more about you. And there were two reasons for people putting bad character. Um, there was propensity and credibility. So the argument was, sometimes you could put it in to say, you have previous convictions and you have you know, pleaded not guilty and it turned out you've done it. So that can go to the fact that you, are, you know, have a history of not telling the truth in court. And then there was the propensity argument. So those are the two reasons that people put it in. And, and you know, the, the, the mere fact that somebody has bad character doesn't necessarily mean that they're dishonest. I actually had a, a client once who was very aggrieved that armed robbery is technically a dishonesty offence because it's it's got an element of theft in it. <laughs> and he was, what's dishonest about it? I just go in there, I say, hand over the money, I'm being really honest, you know. But that has really changed now. And bad character... Um, 
it goes in a lot more often. Now, there is a regime um, which we're going to come on to. But that's what's happened here, you see. In the in the olden days, the mere fact that somebody had a bit of a history of sending, you know, dodgy texts or, you know, assuming the technology exists, that probably wouldn't be considered to be relevant to what did you do on this occasion. I mean, the argument is it shows that person's state of mind. And they'd say, well, no, you'll just look at what the specific, you know, what what is this text done, you know? You know, has it incited? And they say, well, we need to show the intent. Well, the intent can be that somebody posted this and they must have known that a logical and foreseeable consequence of what they posted would stir up the hatred. So you would have just looked at that one individual text. And interestingly, we have another test for excluding evidence, which is that evidence that would otherwise be admissible is more prejudicial than probative. Now, by definition, any evidence the prosecution wants to put in is going to be prejudicial. It's going to make you look bad. It's going to undermine your defence. It's going to assist the prosecution. That's why they're doing it. But the argument would be it's more prejudicial than probative in that it doesn't really, you know, assist in deciding whether they did it on this occasion. But the evidence would paint somebody in such a bad light that the risk there is the jury go, well, we just don't like them. So we're going to convict yeah, anyway. Yeah, and that goes to the but fairness, that, doesn't it? So... Yeah, so, so all, all of this is is going to the fairness of the thing. So is it is it fair? And just to give people a, a context of a very simplistic example, if if someone has, if you take two separate offences, um, let's say one is a, a dishonesty offence of, say, theft or burglary or whatever, another one is completely different, maybe a standalone assault or a standalone drug charge or something like that, completely different, then obviously if the completely different offence went in as evidence, then the a jury may be persuaded, well, this person is already of a criminal type of guy or gal, therefore they, they are more likely to have done this. And that's that's why it's it's deemed to be unfair to go in, unless, of course, it goes in through one of the gateways, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, and so generally, yeah, it, go, it goes to the fairness. Uh, and also, you mentioned briefly, Al, but skipped over it so quickly, I think um, it's worth repeating and people maybe um, find interesting, is when, when you have a defence advocate really attacking prosecution witnesses, which are otherwise of good character and just there to give evidence. But if they start attacking their credibility and undermining them in to such a degree that may seem unfair against them as an independent witness, then again, the prosecution may then say, well, hang on a minute. No, we now want to adduce further bad character evidence against this defendant because that's only fair. You know, what's fair for you attacking our witnesses is then fair to attack the defendant on the same same basis. But yeah, as you again, as you said, Al, looking back at what someone's previously posted, one one thing I think a lot of people, certainly reading from some of the comments, people have been upset about. And so again, speaking generally, but people be upset about looking back at previous comments which did not cross that threshold, but possibly will go in as some sort of evidence if there's if there's a trial. No, there isn't in this case, but if there's going forward going to be a trial, looking back at previous comments that may not have crossed that threshold, but they do give an overall assessment of that character, don't they, Al? Well, yeah, I mean, this, this is something that's cropped up is, you know, what is actual evidence? I mean, there's a big controversy at the moment about where people are trying to prove gang-related convictions by saying that people have a history of listening to particular types of music. It's like, you know, you listen to grime music, grime music is all associated with the gangster lifestyle, therefore the fact that you listen to this is evidence that we're going to allow, allow in to suggest that you're probably a member of a gang. Um, you know, so it's gone a lot wider now. And like I say, it's evidence of bad character. It's not ev necessarily evidence of criminal conduct. And I think this is what one of the controversies is, is that, you know, you, could always, you, you know, when you used to put previous convictions in, it was just previous convictions. It was like, you know, so even if you go over the hurdle of putting them in, it's like, yes, he has been convicted of burglary. He has been convicted of a dishonesty offence, so therefore you might not believe him on it when he's giving evidence. He has been convicted of a violent offence, therefore you might think he wasn't acting in self-defence. But now it's just bad character generally. I mean, you might have wanted to put in a previous conviction just because it's relevant to the offence. Like, say, for instance, if you were prosecuted for driving while disqualified, you had to put in that somebody had been disqualified 
you know so that automatically you know you're going to have to put that in because otherwise that's an you know, you can't prove the offense but i think what's surprising people now is like i say it's character not necessarily criminal criminality so even though these previous texts didn't cross the line uh, apparently because you know they weren't prosecuted you know, she wasn't prosecuted for the previous text because it seemed to be accepted. They were just struck, you know, evidence, it just she was expressing strong opinions. But it's the fact that they were that allowed to put those in to say, right, she holds these particular views, therefore it's less likely that this is just a one-off or that she wasn't thinking or that she just acted, you know, in anger or on the spur of the moment or because she was traumatized about what happened to her child so i think that's something a lot of people might like say find surprising remember it, it's bad character it's not necessarily criminality and you know it, it has been things like just generally being aggressive has been admitted having a reputation for taking drugs has been admitted um you know because they could also put in previous acquittals I mean, that's an interesting one. It's like, well, you have been charged five times before. You've always been acquitted. But what are the odds on they always, like, prosecuting the wrong person? And you can see why. Like, say, 20 years ago, that was the forbidden thinking. Because the argument was, they've been acquitted. It's absolutely yeah, irrelevant. That's, that's, there's an interesting crossover there into, into the civil world, which I'm more familiar with. Because... The, the the mere fact that someone's been prosecuted for something now if you go go with me on this those that are um very very stark anti prosecution but go with me on this the, the the mere fact that someone is prosecuted makes it more likely that they are guilty than not but that's obviously not the criminal standard so on the criminal standard they may well uh, be found not guilty that's not the same as they didn't do it they've been found not guilty as in they they've failed to reach a guilty verdict but in the civil world if you've had someone who is, let's say, take criminal damage, for example, and they've been prosecuted for criminal damage, but there wasn't quite enough evidence to find beyond a reasonable doubt slash the jury was sure that they committed this offence, etc. Um, so they were found not guilty, but you still believe they did it. And on the balance of probabilities, they most likely did it. And there's enough evidence really to suggest they probably did it more likely than not. Then that comes into the civil world, and just the mere fact they were prosecuted makes them more likely than not that they were guilty of the offence. And so that's a different threshold for the civil world that could be useful, which is why all this yeah. is useful in the first place. Do you want to talk about well, the gateways, out Because they're quite interesting as well. This um, yes, because, explains so like why said, these old... come in. Yeah, all, so basically this replaced all the old common law provisions for how you got bad character evidence in. Um, although there are still some ways of doing it because, like I said, you, you know, there's all sorts of sort of like remnants of the common law still out there. But they tried to introduce a statutory framework. Um, and like I say, the, the, these gateways only kick in if you can't get the evidence in just generally. And like I say, say, say for instance... You know, a previous conviction is an element of the offence. You know, you are not allowed to own firearms because you are a, you know, we don't have convicted felons, but, you you know, you've been banned from owning firearms because of a previous conviction. You would have to put that in. But if you just want to put in bad character generally, you've got to try and get it to fit into one or more of these gateways. And again, there can be an overlap between these gateways and there can also be an overlap between these gateways and the various other ways of getting the evidence in. I mean, this is a very common exercise we do actually with the advocacy training. We, we, you know, we say to people, um, right, because you know we have like fake you know, mock trials to test the advocates, the new barristers, but what we'll quite often do is say, right, before we do the trial, let's have an argument about bad character. So this would be done at a separate application. Uh, generally speaking, it's within 20 days of somebody pleading not guilty or indicating a not guilty plea uh, in the Crown Court. The prosecution, if they want to use bad character, they have to ap apply. So they have to say it's going to fit for one of these. And like I say, it's, you know, all parties to the proceedings agree to the evidence being admissible. Um, the way, that's usually, though, where it's a case of you know, the defence advocates will be saying, well, you're probably going to get this in anyway under one of the gateways, so should we just not mess around? Although there may also be tactical reasons that you want to put the um, evidence in. I, I did this once with a, a prolific burglar, 
where I, I you know, I, I, this was in the old days. And I said, said to the officer, I want his bad, I want his previous to go in. The fact that he's been nicked, you know, he's been convicted loads of times. And he said, okay, so, you know, officer, could you just go through this guy's record? And he had about 30 convictions for burglary. But when I put my guy in the box, I said, you've got 30 convictions for burglary. Yes. So you've been through a lot of trials. No. Why not? Well, I've always pleaded guilty. I've always pleaded guilty. So why aren't you pleading guilty this time? Well, I didn't do this one. And, and he was acquitted. So that was one reason I wanted the bad characters to go in. Um, sometimes, like I say, the second game was just it comes out in evidence. You know, the, 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 the defendant puts it in either by accident or, like in that previous example, deliberately. Um, it's important explanatory evidence. I mean, and, uh, these are very nebulous sort of, you know, open things, but that could be something like, um, <clears throat> you know, you need to explain how this particular person, you know, what was this particular person, you know, what, doing in the probation office <laughs> when the fight started? Um, it's relevant oh. to an important matter in issue between the defendant and the prosecution. So that can be things like previous history of violence where it's self-defense um, is being run. It has um, substantive probative uh, value in relation to an important matter in issue between the defendant and a co-defendant. Um, that can be in joint enterprise cases. Look, I, I wasn't there. I was just tagging along. He's the one who kicked off. You know, I, I, I would never start a fight, but my friend has previous convictions for a fray and public order and violent disorder and all that sort of thing. You know, this is what we used to call the old cutthroat defence where basically all the co-defendants start pointing the finger at each other. Um, it's evidence to correct a false impression by the defendant. An obvious example is, um, I I've never been in trouble in my life, officer. I've never had so much as a parking ticket. Well, yeah, you, well, you, got, you, got, you, know, you got a parking ticket. That time you were the getaway driver in that armed robbery. Um, and the defendant has made an attack on another person's character. Now, that's the, the, an old common law one. Just to say, the mere fact that a defendant says that, you know, they didn't do it and the prosecution witnesses are mistaken or even lying, that was never enough to cross the threshold because that was implicit in your defence. It's like, no, no, they've all got it wrong. No, no, they're not telling the truth. That never that, that was deemed not to cross the line, but you, you can't trust that person. They're, they're always lying about they They're always making stuff up. You know, they're just a terrible person. Then that's that's when it it could go in or or if you just yeah, said going we a can't step further in because he's not previous yeah yeah so when they go a step further and they really attack the character rather than just know they're wrong they've got it wrong or hmm. it it's not true they're mistaken that kind of thing it's a bit like again um crossing over with civil cases it's it's different it's one thing in a civil case to say you know they are wrong they are mistaken hmm. uh, they've just got it wrong and then you go further and say they've you know they weren't careful they've made it up they've added things they've deliberately fabricated it and then out and out fraud and so alleging out and out fraud is you know it, it's the, the the extreme you really need to have something that shows that it really was fraud and not just a complete mistake yeah it's, it's the same in defamation uh, we have um, what we call tit for tat and what they call in America self-defense. So if somebody accuses you of something and you say that's not true, they can't bring a defamation claim on the grounds that you are effectively accusing them of being a liar. You know, you're saying no, no. And, and, and again, you can go quite strong in defamation. You can say that's not true. They're lying about me. You can't trust them. They're terribly untrustworthy people. So long as you actually just stick to denying the allegation, you can do it in very robust terms and you can't be sued for defamation as long as you don't go beyond just denying that. So, you know, it's like, you can't, yeah, no, that's not true. They're always making stuff up. They're loopy, you know, they're a known liar. You're allowed to say that, but if you sort of say something like, and anyway, how can you trust them when they're uh, something, you know, beyond <laughs> beyond a liar, then that, that could form a defamation case. So you do see there's like quite a lot of overlap in the law between general principles. Although then again, a lot of the time, there's lots of overlap in the law where they actually do apply different standards and they do take different approaches. I mean, you know, like, I mean, hearsay is now a lot generally admissible even in criminal trials. It started off, it wasn't admissible at all. Then it became admissible per se in civil trials. And now it's starting to creep in where it's a lot more admissible in criminal trials. So, you know, we're evolving towards having the same approach. 
in you know the law generally but it's not uncommon for different areas of law to actually have different tests for things like admissibility of evidence and just on hearsay a lot of people misunderstand hearsay and why why it's um, not relevant or why it becomes relevant and so when we talk about hearsay it's not it's not just the fact that someone else said something it's when you're trying to prove the truth of whatever they said or wrote or showed or it could you know hearsay could be a diagram or, or whatever but it's when you when you want to prove the truth of whatever was stated then it would be hearsay otherwise otherwise it's just evidence if you wanted to say this person wrote a message that said this meet me at 12 to do the exchange or whatever that's just the fact that he wrote a message. If you want to say, therefore, that proves that he was intending to meet and do some illegal deal, whatever, that's the truth of the message and that makes it hearsay. So it's an important distinction, yeah. particularly for law students, that uh, once you get your head around that, it's actually really interesting. It's not just he said, she said, therefore, it's less less valuable. Although I've got an interesting story about a hearsay, because I, I'm obviously known for martial arts, the black belt in black belt barrister is not just a um, just a play on words. But um, I am actually a black belt, so hanging up here. Um, so I've taught martial arts for many years, usually for free. And um, for most of the 30 something years that I've done martial arts, whenever I've been teaching, it's been for free, and I've done a lot of it. And so I was running free sessions at a school. And the school came to me and said, can you do another one here and another one here and another one here? And I just didn't have the time. And so there was there was a discussion as to how much time I could commit to doing that. And then I heard on the grapevine that apparently I was desperate for more work from this school to teach martial arts and after their money. And it couldn't have been further from the truth because they never paid me a penny. But that's where, you know, hearsay can be <laughs> really, uh, really damaging when people do believe this stuff. And it's obviously just complete nonsense. Anyway, we digress. Well, that's why it's generally never used to be admissible because the idea was it was harder to test. I mean, one of my favourite examples of hearsay was a ship's captain taking his wife and children on board the ship. And they wanted to put that evidence, as evidence that the ship was seaworthy and said, no, that's technically hearsay. But yeah, it has to go for the truth of its contents. So if the police find a note saying... Um, you know, from somebody advertising going, best prices on things in town... That's not evidence that he does have the best prices on, you know, illegal substances. It's just evidence that he is willing to sell illegal substances. So, that, so that, that that's the distinction. But yeah, I mean, the 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 the, the, the idea with hearsay is the further removed away because we used to have this thing called the best evidence rule, which was you always had to put in the best evidence. So, to give an example, um, you know, it, it had to be original documents, not photocopies. Um, to give actually an example from that trial, you know, that, that defamation trial where there was the makeup thing and there was all the argument about where she, you know, somebody said, here's the makeup that I used to cover the bruises. And this, and then it came out, well, actually that makeup wasn't available at the time. Well, the best evidence rule says you should have said, here's the actual makeup that I personally use. This is my own makeup compact. But if that's not available, it should be, here's an identical compact to the one I used. And if that's not available, here's a compact similar to the one that I used. Now, you know, you are permitted to say, I don't have the original, but this is something very much like it for illustrative purposes. But you just have to identify that that's what you're doing, you know, that you... you because otherwise, because of the best evidence rule, you are suggesting that is the actual item. So if you're not putting forward the actual item, you have to explain that that's not the item. So there's all these little peripheral things. But, I mean, to get back to the original story, um, pe people, you've commented about how there is a distinction between what is just strong opinion that doesn't cross the line into criminality and then what is the criminal ones that you can be prosecuted on. But I think this is something people might find surprising and need to be aware of. Your previous non-criminal comments can go in as evidence to show that your other comment did cross the line and became criminal because, you know, they have to show the intent to stir racial hatred. Now, if all your previous postings have all been sort of like, all, you know, I love everybody, you know, all very you know, non-committal, all very nice, all very compassionate, and, and there's just no history of that, 
then you stand a much better chance of arguing that that was just a one-off or I didn't mean it or it's been misinterpreted. But if you have a history, I mean, some people do that. Some people, there's this idea of something called pause law, where people will pause something being sarcastic, but it's not recognised as sarcasm. Because, it, you know, no matter how outrageous your statement is, there's probably a real person who would actually make that statement and agree with it. So this is why, you know, on the internet, people will do that, you know, sort of stroke S thing to highlight that they are being sarcastic. Because it could be a defence to say, I was being sarcastic, or I was applying pause law, or I was just making an illustration as to what other people would do. And then they could look at all your previous postings and say, okay, yeah, that is consistent with your online views. So I think that's something that, you know, people... And I'm sure we'll get lots of comments about that as to how fair it is, because effectively you are putting in evidence of people's political opinions. But, you know, be aware of that. Bad character doesn't mean previous convictions or previous criminality. It just, and we'll get into this, because a lot of people no doubt say, well, hang on, that is just a strong opinion. So how is that bad character? Well, you know, what does that say about me? You know, I am allowed to hold strong opinions, and that doesn't make me a bad person. So it's very interesting. But, you know, obviously the CPS will have said to the defence, here's the evidence of this. We've got the tweet itself, and we want we will be applying to put in all this previous material. And the defence presumably went, well, chances are the judge is going to allow that to go in, so we may as well plead. Yeah, well, there you go. And it, so it shows uh, a whole history there, doesn't it? So... Yeah, very interesting. So in a, in a roundabout, very odd way, the government, the government got it right when they said, think before you post. Although, ironically, uh, this this morning I read, uh, deleted a meme that apparently they got slated for. So uh, they did posted a, a meme about um, going back to school and then obviously thought better of it. And some, well, someone thought better of it. Um, if it was genuine, I think it was genuine. Someone thought better of it and said, better delete this. And so they deleted it. So ironically, yeah, think before you post. But um, that is why addressing some of the comments, um, I'll link the original video in the description from yesterday, um, talking about, generally talking about this again, but the offense uh, in more detail. Um, I'll also link Al's channel below. You've just, I mean, well done on your uh, breaking 30,000 subscribers. It just proves that this this YouTube thing really does take time. You really do have to take time. I mean, as, as fantastic as your content is, Al, it still has taken a long time. Um, even if I may say so, with me plugging it with, with, with two Absolutely. channels here, still takes time. So... Um, but I advocate anyone that wants an alternative uh, way to express themselves and do it on YouTube, you can do it here. Um, we, we enjoy it and we invite you to do the same. So do subscribe to Al, linked below. Um, hope you found that, um, how do you say Al, vaguely useful, vaguely interesting, vaguely accurate. Vaguely <laughs> accurate, yes. Well, there you Which go. Which is nice because this is an unusual video for me. I mean, one of my favourite comments on, on my channel was somebody who said, come for the legal chat, stay to see if he walks off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do like my walks. And, and for the record, when I um, when I encourage you to go out on these walks and, you know, around by the scenic views, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to walk off a cliff and eliminate the competition. I helped set Al's channel up. So you <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you look back at the very early videos... Um, Actually, I think some of them were just me uh, trying to get it off the ground, which yeah. um, this is not to be disingenuous in the slightest, but just because people recognize me on the thumbnail, people click it. That's that's what how YouTube works. Well, it's the other way around, because I took you to one of my favorite filming spots, which is like about six inches from a 200 foot drop off a cliff and then we tried to use your drone which decided to kill us by hovering just out of reach right on the cliff edge. Yeah. <laughs> it just wouldn't come back. But you, you couldn't make that up. Literally, my, my drone, um, I, I don't think I've actually used this footage yet, but I, my drone took off and then, for whatever reason, decided to disconnect between the controller, which was about just six feet up in the air, just too high that I couldn't reach the thing. I thought, why? Right. What, am I going to try and lean over the edge of the cliff to retrieve it or just stand here and watch until it eventually dies and falls into oblivion? But eventually first it, it did connect and, and come back. But um, but yeah, uh, all, all very interesting. But uh, yeah, no, we, we better, better come down again soon and uh, do some more of those on the uh, on the clifftops. But yeah, don't, don't Absolutely. Move. 
Yeah, don't don't walk too close to the edge, Al. But no, go no, check no, out Al's I, videos I, with the trouble, beautiful I'm views. Sort of just like looking because some people say, "Oh, remember to look at the camera when you're walking." But it's like, yeah, but then I just walk into oblivion. But anyway, but th but thank you, yes, thank you to everybody who has subscribed to the channel. It is very much appreciated. Fantastic. So um, thanks for the chat, Al. Very useful. I hope everyone found that interesting. Uh, do subscribe and leave comments below, questions and things that, uh, particularly if you've got, I know we've got law students and barristers and, and all sorts of uh, other viewers, so leave your thoughts, comments, and what you'd like us to chat about in the next one. And with that, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.